All right, Genesis chapter number 23 here. So basically, it's a brief overview. There's really not a whole lot of things going on in this chapter. Basically, we see Sarah dies, and Abraham goes about negotiating, getting a, a burying place for her to bury, to bury his dead. Let's get into this chapter a little bit. I want to point out something a little bit different that, that when I was studying for uh, preaching on this, I learned something that was kind of neat, and I want to share that with you tonight. And it's right in the beginning of the passage here. Look at verse number one. The Bible says, And Sarah was 107 and 20 years old. These were the years of the life of Sarah. Sarah lived to be 127 years old. That's pretty old. Um, obviously, she was um, like 90, around 90 years old when she gave birth to Isaac. So she, she lived until Isaac was, you know, 37 years old roughly before she died. So that's, that's um, you know, she got to see her son grow up to, to and not to get married quite yet, but, but she got to see him grow up for 37 years of his life. And now she's dying here in chapter 23. Look at verse number two. And it says, And Sarah died in Kirjath Arba. The same is Hebron in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. So here, they're, they're we were, the place where she dies, where they were staying at this time, is Kirjith Arba. Now, it says the same as Hebron, so it's also known by the name of Hebron. Hebron is mentioned quite a few times, especially in the Old Testament. Hebron is actually the place where um, King David first started to reign after Saul died, and then he was brought into Jerusalem. This is of their inheritance. This is in the land of Canaan, right? Abraham was promised the land of Canaan. It's going to be many, many more years before Moses brings the children of Israel out of Egypt to then go in and inherit this promised land, this land of Canaan. Okay, now Kirjith Arba, and I just, just remember that that's also another name for Hebron. We're going to see that as we look a little bit closer into this. Um, turn, if you would, to Joshua 21. Obviously, keep a finger here. But turn, if you would, to Joshua chapter number 21. We're going to see a little bit more about this land. Kirjath Arba. So in Joshua chapter 21, look at verse number 11. The Bible reads, And they gave them the city of Arba, the father of Anak, which city is Hebron in the hill country of Judah, with the suburbs are around about it. So this is the same place it's talking about, right? And notice it says, this is the city of Arba. Now that word Kirjath, you'll see like Kirjath Jerem, Kirjath Arba. Um, you'll start to notice this as you read the Bible. There's these same words, like these same root words, the same prefixes on words. Now, I don't speak Hebrew, right? I am not, uh, I, I do not claim to be, but... Even without speaking the language, what's really neat is that, and oftentimes what's better, because I actually looked up what this word was, what the word kirjeth meant, and especially kirjeth arba. And, you know, some people say one thing, some people say another. If you just go based off of what some scholar says, oftentimes it's going to be wrong. And I, I can't remember the exact definition of what they said, but we see, and this is what's neat. You study the Bible long enough, and, and, you keep these things in your mind and you start looking at it and you start putting pieces together, you could understand what a lot of this stuff means without ever having to go to a Hebrew lexicon or dictionary or anything like that to figure this stuff out. It's said here that Kirjith Arba, the same as Hebron, Joshua 21.11 says, and they gave them the city of Arba. And that word Kirjith just means the city of. That's what that means. And I, I could prove that to you. I don't remember if I have all the scripture in here to do that. Um, but that's what that means. And it says here that Arba, so the city of Arba, Arba was a man. And it says here he was the father of Anak. Now, we'll get to, to who Anak is, but if you remember the Anakims, remember that is as a people, the Anakims, they were the giants. Okay, and if you remember in Genesis chapter 6 and verse number 4, you don't have to turn there, uh, turn if you would to Joshua 14. 
In Genesis 6, 4, this was before the flood even, the Bible says there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. This is introducing us to, to just the fact that giants existed in the world. And this is pre-Noah flood, but we know that the giants were around even after the flood. Because David and Goliath... Because all these other stories, when the children of Israel were going into the promised land and they saw that there were giants there. So we know that they existed after the fact. And um, just real briefly, because I, I'm so sick of this doctrine that people say that, oh, you know, the, the, the angels came down and they, they fornicated with, with human women. And there's this mixed, like alien breed of, of half angel, half human. And that's who the giants are. It's nonsense. And I'm not going to go into it. I've done it in other sermons. But even just from this one verse in Genesis chapter 6, verse 4, it says, first, there were giants in the earth in those days. And also, after that, after what? After there were giants in the earth in those days, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men. So even if you wanted to claim that the sons of God it's talking there is not a human being, which sons of God are always referred to as human beings. People who are saved are sons of God. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And again, I'm not going to exhaust that, this whole study on the giants and on the sons of God. But even if you want to believe that the sons of God is referring to an angel, the Bible says right here there are giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men. The giants were there first. And then this happened. So... That should settle it right there for you. And that's as far as I'm going to get into that because I want to point out something a little bit just, just kind of interesting about, about this, whole, this whole situation here. You're in Joshua 14. Look at verse number 12. This is the same land. Now we look at Kirjath Arba. This is the city of Arba who was the father of Anak. This land where Abraham is dwelling right now, where Sarah dies, is the same land that they had gone into when they were searching and seeking out the promised land, when Moses sent the 12 people in to, to go spy out the land and see what kind of a land is this, you know, but right when they were getting um, ready to go. So in Joshua 14, verse 12, the Bible says, Now therefore give me this mountain, this is Caleb talking, whereof the Lord spake in that day, for thou heardest in that day how the Anakims were there. And that the cities were great and fenced. If so be, the Lord will be with me. Then I shall be able to drive them out, as the Lord said. And Joshua blessed him and gave unto Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, Hebron for an inheritance. Remember, Hebron is the same name as Kirjath Arba. And um, verse 14, Hebron therefore became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, unto this day, because that he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. And the name of Hebron before was Kirjath Arba, which Arba was a great man among the Anakims, and the land had rest from war. So it's, it's, it's basically telling us Arba was one of the Anakims, and our Anak, Anak was actually his son. He was the father of Anak, but he was a great man among the Anakims. And Anakims is referring to the fact that they were giants, right? So Arba was a great man among the Anakims. Turn, if you would, now to Numbers chapter 13. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Numbers chapter 13. Numbers 13, verse number 21. The Bible reads, so they went up, and this is the report that's going to, you know, Moses sending the people out into the promised land and coming back. This is the context where we are in Numbers 13, verse 21. So they went up and searched the land from the wilderness of Zin unto Rehob as men come to Hamath. And they ascended by the south and came unto Hebron. The south would be like the area of Judah. They came unto Hebron where Ahiman, Shishai, and Talmai, the children of Anak, were. Now Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. And they came unto the brook Eshgal and cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes and they bare it between two upon a staff. And they brought of the pomegranates and of the figs. The place was called the brook Eshgal because of the cluster of grapes which the children of Israel cut down from thence. And they returned from searching of the land after 40 days. 
And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran, to Kadesh, and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwelt, dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of a great stature. It means they're really tall. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. Now, we're reading all of this. Just I just want to show you all these different references, and that's not even all of them, of the sons of Anak being the giants. And, and Arba was the father of Anak. And this is where they live. Now, the place is called Kirjath Arba while they're there, which means Arba is either still alive or had already been alive. And, you know, and, and that place was named after him. It's the city of Arba where they were. And he was of the giants. So Abraham is living in this place where there's giants. And the reason why I'm even going into all this detail and pointing this out is because, look at, go, go back to Genesis chapter 23. And I find this pretty amazing. It's, a, it's another testimony to the character of Abraham. Look at the amount of respect that was shown to Abraham, even being very old. And mind you, he's in their land. He's the stranger. He's the foreigner. He's dwelling among these people who are, you know, of the giants. Now, I'm not saying every single person that lived there was a giant, but the giants were definitely part of that. And look at what it says in verse number six. They said, hear us, my Lord. Right? So referring to him as my Lord. Thou art a mighty prince among us. A prince is like, you know, I mean, he's, he's like a ruler, basically, and of, of his own. Because he's got a big household. He's got a lot of people under him and stuff. He's got, he's got a lot of wealth. But they're saying, you're like a prince among us. Thou art a mighty prince among us in the choice of our sepulchers. That's the best of our sepulchers that we have. Bury your dead. They're bestowing this honor upon him, who's a stranger, who's a foreigner. They're pretty powerful. They're pretty mighty people, these, these big giants, right? The same giants that the children of Israel, when they come out of Egypt, and they have a, a huge amount of people, right? A huge following, a huge army. They were afraid of. These are the same people that respected Abraham, right? Now, obviously, this is, this is generations have passed, but still, he's in this place. The sons of Anak and the Anakims were, were, were of the giants, right? So, he's living in this place, and um, it says, Thou art a mighty prince among us. In the choice of our sepulchres, bury thy dead. None of us shall withhold from thee his sepulchre, but that thou mayest bury thy dead. Now, um, besides the fact that God had already blessed Abraham with a lot of substance, with a lot of cattle and, and, you know, and physical things and the servants of his household and stuff. I mean, we remember going all the way back when, when he went after Lot and his, his servants came with him. Abraham was a man that was an upright man of God. He was a man of his word. He was something, a person that people can follow and listen to, and he commanded respect, even the respect of this people of the giants. But I think the other reason why they had respect to him, it's not because he kind of had a lot of power and influence, because he had a lot of, you know, a lot of servants and all this stuff. I believe that it was also because he was a very humble man. He wasn't out making enemies. He was trying his best to live at peace with people. You remember when um, he had that conflict with, um, 
what was the name of that king the, um, just a few chapters ago about the well, right? And he didn't even mention it before. Like his servants came and they took it by force and he didn't even bring it up until finally he wanted to like make a pact where they were going to make a non-aggression pact with each other. And he's like, well, you know, if we're going to do this, you, your guys, you know, took my, my well by force. They violently took it away from me. And, um, you know, he, he brought it up, but he was still very tactful and wise about it. And I went over that when we preached on that sermon. But um, we see these same attributes of Abraham as we continue through all of these stories. And even here, look at what he does in verse number seven. After they just say to him, you know, our Lord, you know, my Lord, you're a prince. You can have the best of our land. Right. And they're really bestowing honor upon him by by saying this to him. Look at how he responds to them in verse number seven. And Abraham stood up and bowed himself to the people of the land, even to the children of health. So instead of being lifted up with pride because, you know, these people are all basically, you know, giving me all this honor and respect and stuff. So I'm going to puff myself up and just take it all in. What does he do? He bows himself down and shows them respect right back and appreciates what they're doing. And then he goes into this whole dialogue here. We'll, um, we'll continue with that. We'll see, you know, as he... Um, in verse number 8, let's keep reading. He says, And he communed with them, saying, If it be in your mind, if it be your mind that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me and entreat for me, to Ephron, the son of Zohar. He's like, so, you know, if this is something that you are going to do for me, then talk to Ephron because that's where I want the land to bury Sarah. I want it to be in his field. He says that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he hath, which is in the end of his field for as much money as it is worth. He shall give it me for a possession of a burying place amongst you. And again, he's not, he's not asking them or telling them to give him anything. He's saying... You know, for as much money as it's worth, I'll pay for it. I just, I'm asking you for a possession among, because he's a, he's a stranger there. But he's asking them for a piece of property, for a piece of land that he can own for the purpose of a graveyard, a purpose of him being able to, to have his own place to be able to bury his dead that'll belong to him. And he's willing to pay for it and everything else. So then they say, they say in verse number 11, or in verse number 10, it says, And Ephron dwelt among the children of Heth. So Ephron's there. And Ephron the Hittite answered Abraham in the audience of the children of Heth, even of all that went in at the gate of his city, saying, Nay, my lord, hear me. The field give I thee. In the cave that is therein, I give it thee. In the presence of the sons of my people, give I it thee, bury that it. So they're being very nice and gracious and hospitable to Abraham and very respectful and saying, You know what? You could just have it. He's saying, I'm just going to give it to you. I don't even want any money for it. Please, Abraham, you can just take it. But what, how does Abraham respond? Verse number 12. And Abraham bowed down himself before the people of land. So he bows down again. Very humble man. He's not, he's not getting lifted up and proud about any of this. And, and here's the thing. Here's a man with great substance. And oftentimes we run into people that have nice houses, as we did today, and, and very you know, a lot of nice things. And they have a tendency to be very proud about it and showing it off. And, oh, look how great this is. And look at, you know, and, and all this other stuff. Abraham was not like that at all. And oftentimes, this is, when you get a lot of things off, it could go to your head. This is one of the, the, the traps of, of having a lot of riches. This is why in Proverbs it says, um, you know, Lord, you know, my prayer is that... that um, and I'm going to totally misquote it, where he says to, um, you know, give me enough food, basically is what I need. Give me enough bread so that I don't go hungry, because I don't want to go hungry and steal, you know, and blaspheme my name. But I also don't want to um, be filled with riches and forget the Lord and just, and just get puffed up in all this accumulation of stuff. Because what people have a tendency to do when you get a lot of things, especially when people are giving it to you and, and you know, other people, whatever, however you accumulate, whether you work for it real hard yourself or people giving you all this stuff and you just have all these things, you start thinking, I really deserve all this stuff. And that's the, start, the, the type of attitude that you start to have. And, well, what about other people? 
why don't they have something? Well, they don't deserve it. But I really deserve it because I'm such a great person, because I work really hard, because I do this, because I do that. And this is the type of attitude that leads you to be getting real puffed up and arrogant and proud. And this is the exact opposite, because then you start thinking and you start expecting that from people. And then, if you start expecting that from people, are you going to be bowing down before them when they offer you something? You're going to be like, yeah, give it to me. You know, actually, I need you guys to give me a piece of your land so I can bury my dead. Right? That would be someone who's lifted up and proud and just kind of, you know, all full of themselves saying, I deserve this. Hey, I've been here for a long time. I never hurt you guys. I've got all this substance. God's with me. I want you to give me some of your land. That's what Abraham could have done if he was full of pride. But he didn't do that at all. He humbled himself. He bowed down. He was a great man. He was a friend of God. But he didn't let any of this stuff get to his head. And if you are someone that does either now or one day end up having a lot of things, God blesses you financially, hey, there's nothing wrong with that. And praise the Lord if you, if, you, if you have a lot of things. Don't ever let it get to your head, though. Keep your humility. Keep the humbleness like Abraham did, where he's able to bow down twice. And, you know, even if someone's saying, no, you can have it free, he, say, he, he gets down, look what he says. Verse number 13, And he spake unto Ephron and the audience of the people of the land, saying, But if thou wilt give it, so he said, if you're going to give it, if you want to give it to me, I pray thee, hear me. I will give thee money for the field, Take it of me and I will bury my dead. So saying, if you're willing to give it to me, then just take my money. And Ephron answered Abraham, saying unto him, My Lord, hearken unto me, the land is worth 400 shekels of silver. What is that betwixt me and thee? Bury therefore thy dead. So he's saying, look, it's worth 400 shekels of silver. He's like, it's worth, you know, $4,000, 400 bucks, whatever. He's saying, who cares? That's what it's worth. You know, you want to pay me? Fine. He's saying, basically saying, what is that between me and you? No big deal, right? I don't care about the money. It's, it's worth, it, this is what it's worth, but what is that between me and you? And that's a great attitude to have too, you know. He's saying, well, whatever. If you really just want to pay for it, this is what it's worth. So Abraham does it, and he pays him in verse number um, 16. And Abraham hearkened unto Ephron. He says, okay, well... Um, that's the price. Then he goes, here you go. And Abraham weighed to Ephron the silver, which he had named in the audience of the sons of Heth, 400 shekels of silver, current money with the merchant. And this is all done before. If you noticed a few, in a few places, it talks about before the people who sat at the gate. And in this time, you, you'll notice this all throughout the Old Testament, especially people who sit at the gate, people who are known at the gate. Um, Proverbs 31 talks about her husband is known um, and sits at the gate. It's the people who are kind of like in charge and respectable and tend to be like elders of the land and people who, who kind of operate business and you know, um, would be looked to for, for settling matters. And it's, it's like a legal transaction here. They're, they're going before, almost like before judges, right? The people who sit at the gate. This is, this is the type of person who that is when it's referring to them that sit at the gate. So, it's, you know, this is a public transaction and, you know, they're, he's being very clear about everything just to make sure that, hey, you know, this transaction is legitimate. Everything's happened. Here, I've weighed out the money. Everybody can see this all public view and it's all done, you know, in front of everybody. And, um, and he buys it of them. And it's made sure unto him. Verse 17 says, In the field of Ephron, which was in Machpelah, which was before Mamre, the field and the cave which was therein, and all the trees that were in the field, that were in all the borders round about, were made sure. That's what it means by made. It was, it was basically made sure, given unto Abraham. Everything was, was done appropriately, and the, the ownership was transferred to Abraham. Um, verse 18 um, Everything were made sure unto Abraham for possession in the presence of the children of Heth before all that went in at the gate of his city. So there we see a reference to it again. There's like one or two other references earlier in the chapter as well. Before all that went in at the gate of his city. And after this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah before Mamre, the same as Hebron in the land of Canaan. And the field and the cave that is therein were made sure unto Abraham for a possession of a burying place by the sons of Heth. And that's the end of the chapter. Now, I want to spend the rest of the time going over, because this is what the whole chapter is about anyways, is burying 
the dead. And why we as Christians bury our dead and why I don't believe we should be cremated or doing anything like that. Now, obviously, like after you die, you have no control what other people do to you, right? What other people do to your body, um, that is out of your control. The best you can do is leave a will, and if people are, are going to honor your word and your wishes, then they'll do that. And ultimately, in the end, it's not of eternal significance of what, you know, what happens because you will get the new body, but I'm going to explain why we do this tradition, if you are, this custom of burying the dead. There's actually quite a few reasons, but, but we're going to, I'm just going to stick with just scripturally why this is something that we do. Now, this is the first place, and, and this entire chapter is kind of dedicated to this idea, this concept of burying the dead. Abraham goes through a lot of effort and trouble to make sure that he has a place laid out for him specifically to bury his dead. Because he could have just burned the body and been done with it. Right? I mean, that's one way you could have disposed of Sarah's dead body. Now, again, after, after uh, our spirit and our souls depart from our body, the body is just a shell. Um, and ultimately, when you're buried, what's going to happen? I mean, over time, over years, it's going to decompose, and, and it, you will you know, essentially just go back into the earth and become dust. But there's a lot of symbolism involved with being buried. So... Um, Turn, if you go to Genesis 47, because there is an importance laid on burial. We see the effort that Abraham makes. We see it again with Israel, with Jacob, before Jacob dies. In Genesis chapter 47, we're going to see this, right near the end of the book of Genesis. Look at verse 29 of Genesis 47. It says, And the time drew nigh that Israel must die. And he called his son Joseph and said unto him, if now I have found grace in thy sight, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh and deal kindly and truly with me. Bury me not, I pray thee, in Egypt, but I will lie with my fathers, and thou shalt carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burying place. And he said, I will do as thou hast said. So right before Israel dies, right before Jacob dies, he's giving Joseph some commandments. He's giving his sons commandments saying, look, this is what I want you to do with my body. I don't want to be buried here in Egypt. Because remember, he came into Egypt because that's where they had the, the corn and the food and the sustenance. And Joseph was able to provide for them during the years of famine and everything. And that's where they ended up staying. And, um, but he's saying, I don't want my body to be laid to rest here. I want you to put me, and it goes into this burying place, into the sepulcher with, uh, that, that Abraham bought. And he's like, that's where I want to be laid. And, and he says, he promises and he does, and he does end up doing it. He buries him in another place. So we see another example here where the burial is important. We don't see ever in Scripture Christians, you know, cremating somebody and burning them up. Now, we see this in the law. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 21. We're going to see burial even in the law, in the Mosaic law. Deuteronomy 21. Deuteronomy 21, verse number 22, the Bible reads, And if a man have committed a sin worthy of death, and he be put to death, and he be to be put to death, and thou hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day. For he that is hanged is accursed of God, that thy land be not defiled which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. So here we're seeing not just people putting an importance on this, right? Like Abraham and Israel kind of making a big deal of this. Here we see God stating that, okay, if someone commits a sin and it's worthy of the death penalty and you put them to death and then you want to hang them on a tree, because this is something that I don't believe that the hanging on a tree is like, the form of execution. I think this is something that they did, the, the way that it's written, is that um, you know, he's put to death and thou hang him on a tree. Like something that's done to publicly just, just put him up there 
you know, on display, like this guy committed adultery or this guy did, you know, and they, and they put him up there. He's saying, you know, you put him on a tree, he said his body is not going to remain all night on that tree. He says, you cannot, part of God's law, do not leave that body all night up on that tree. And he says, thou shalt in any wise bury him that day. Bury, he tells him to bury him. He doesn't say to do anything else with the body but to bury it. He says, bury him that day because for he that is hanged is accursed of God. And look at this. He says, that thy land be not defiled. If they were to leave that body just hanging up there, he says, the land is going to be defiled. God ordained, God commanded that the body should be buried in order for the land not to be defiled, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. Now, turn, if you would, to 2 Kings chapter 23, because here we're going to see an example where actually people's bones, men's bones being burnt, is a, a desecration. It's a dishonor for that to happen. Which is, again, look, I'm going over a lot of reasons why I don't believe that, pe that Christians should be cremated. I believe that's something that the heathen can do and that, and that they do do, but that is not something that we ought to be following as Christians. 2 Kings chapter 23, look at verse number 16. This is the, that King Josiah that, that made a lot of things right in Israel after they had gone so bad for so many years. He really followed the Lord with all of his heart and, and got rid of a lot of wickedness out of Israel um, right near the end of, of uh, right before Israel ends up getting um, taken over and taken captive and things like that. But look at 2 Kings 23, verse 16. The Bible says, And as Josiah turned himself, he spied the sepulchers that were there in the mount and sent and took the bones out of the sepulchers and burned them upon the altar. Look at this. And polluted it according to the word of the Lord, which the man of God proclaimed who proclaimed these words. Then he said, What title is that that I see? And the men of the city told him, It is the sepulcher of the man of God, which came from Judah, and proclaimed these things that thou hast done against the altar of Bethel. And he said, Let him alone, let no man move his bones. So they let his bones alone with the bones of the prophet that came out of Samaria. Now, if you remember this story, this story was from all the way back when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, made Israel sin. When, when you had King Saul, then King David, then King Solomon, right? But Solomon, in the end of his life, turned his heart from God. His wives turned his heart away from God. So because of that, God said, I am going to rend the kingdom from you. And he divided it up, but he still left the kingdom of Judah for them to rule for the house of David, basically still to have a king to rule over because David was such a great man. But because Solomon screwed things up, his son Rehoboam then lost the majority of the kingdom. He was just left with Judah, and the rest of the kingdom then was given to Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Now, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, was worried that the children of Israel in his kingdom were going to go back to Judah because that's where Jerusalem was, that's where the house of God was, and that's where he was worried that as they go to worship the Lord, that they're going to say, yeah, we want to follow the house of David again, and he's going to get killed and, and deposed and everything else, and he's going to lose the kingdom. He was worried about that. Now, he shouldn't have been because God's the one that gave him the kingdom. He should have been worried about people going to worship God in that, in that place and in Jerusalem. But he was, so what he did was he built up these other altars. He made these golden calves and said, these be thy God. So he made these idols for the people to worship. And that was extremely wicked because he caused like the entire nation of Israel to get into sin and get into this idolatry. Because they did start doing that then. They did start worshiping in those places. And Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, was always turned, looked on then as someone that, that kings are kind of compared to of how wicked they are. Like, they were wicked, but they weren't quite as wicked as Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Right? If, you're, if you're reading through the book of Kings, you'll see that often. But what happened after he made those altars... This prophet came and, and prophesied that Josiah by name was going to come and that the altar was going to be desecrated and men's bones were going to be you know, All this stuff he prophesied. And it's amazing the, the amount of time that goes by in between that prophecy and then Josiah actually literally coming and doing all of these very things.
And that's what we see here in 2 Kings 23. He was fulfilling this prophecy, but one of the things that he did was that he took the bones of those people, of those, of those false prophets and the people of the land and the people that sinned against God and desecrated their burying place and from their sepulchres and burned them on that, that altar for the, for the idols, for the false god that shouldn't have been there, and he desecrated all of it by doing that, by cremating, by burning them on there. That was a desecration. And, but then you see he left the, the prophet, the man of God that actually went and prophesied that. Because the prophet then was told to go out another way. Don't go the same way you came in. Don't sit down to eat. Don't do anything. And then another guy met him and was like, hey, you know, an angel told me that, that he wants you to come and have dinner with me. So the, so the prophet listened to him. The, but the guy was lying. So then after he left, then, uh, you know, a lion met him and killed him and everything like that. So he ended up getting buried in that place. Because he didn't obey God, he was supposed to just get out of there. But that's, that's a whole other story. But that same prophet, Josiah does not dig up his bones and burn them on the altar. He leaves them to, at rest. He leaves them in the place that they ought to be. And because he didn't want to desecrate that man's bones. And we see here a difference between, hey, here's someone who is saved. Here's a prophet. Here's someone who's righteous. We're not going to burn his bones because that would be a desecration. We're going to leave them buried. Plenty of evidence, right? Now, one of the reasons why, why should we not burn our bodies? Well, our end is not to be burned. The whole symbolic reference of, of why we are even buried is destroyed when you destroy the body. When you destroy it and burn it up. That would be like a picture of hell. Someone's body just being burned up and disintegrated, you know, just, just completely annihilated, wiped out, destroyed, destruction. That would be a symbolic reference of hell. But we have, turn if you would to 1 Corinthians 15, and this will be the last place that we turn to. 1 Corinthians 15 is a really good job of explaining this. And is really the main source that I would ever turn to for proof of, of the symbolic act of burying a body and why that is important. Um, a lot of things that we do carry extra meaning. Marriage, right? Ephesians 5 explains the extra meanings behind our marriage, right? Obedience to our parents. A lot, a lot of the laws, a lot of these commandments have multiple meanings and are, are symbolic of greater truths. And it's part of our daily lives. It's part of how we live. So even in death and what we do with the dead is also symbolic. And we don't want to be messing up these symbolic references. Let's start reading verse number 34 of 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. The Bible reads, Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. But some man will say, how are the dead raised up and with what body do they come? So we're going to start going into the resurrection, right? The resurrection is our, is our bodies coming back up out of the earth. And, and one of the important reasons why we don't burn the bodies is because our bodies are going to come back. Now, does that mean God is completely incapable of, if a saved person's body has been cremated? No. Of course he's capable, just like people who've died thousands of years ago whose bones have already crumbled into, into dust, they've completely decomposed, they'll get the new body too. So it's not something we have to worry about, you know, screwing up our new, our new body. But the, but the reference and the symbolism is there of us getting buried. Let's just keep reading. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Verse 35, so some man will say, how are the dead raised up and with what body do they come? Verse 36, thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bear grain. It may chance of wheat or of some other grain, but God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. 
There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars, for one star differeth from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. <coughs> it is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul and the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural. And afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength, the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now, the whole symbolic reference, if you didn't get this by reading this whole portion of Scripture, our bodies are being sown in the ground. We're sown in corruption. Our body is a corrupted, sinful, fleshly body. Right? And what he's explaining in this passage is that just like a seed, you get a seed, you sow that, you bury that in the ground, and it gets watered and everything else. And that seed breaks open and it dies. Essentially, the seed itself dies, but then the new life springs up. And it's completely different, right? I mean, the, the seed that like, you look inside of an apple, and you look at an apple seed, and then you look at an apple tree, they look nothing alike, right? I mean, you got this one little brown seed and you got this beautiful green tree with leaves and apples springing off and stuff like that. It's completely different. Our bodies are sown. And he's saying here, our bodies are sown in the ground when we're buried, right? But what that is, it's symbolic of the resurrection of our new body, our transformed, our transfigured body. It's going to be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. We are going to have that brand new body, but it's sown in corruption. It's sown in unrighteousness. It goes down in the ground, this corruptible body, this body that is imperfect, this flesh that causes us to sin. But when we get our new body, and, and that's why he says also, you know, we are born in the image of the earthy, of Adam, right? But when we get the new body, we'll be like Christ. It'll be in the image of Christ, in His glorified body, and we'll be in our glorified bodies, in our new bodies that does not have corruption, that is perfect, just like our spirit right now is perfect, the earnest that we have, the earnest that God has given us, that down payment that, that He's put into our, into our hearts, that spirit, that perfect spirit that cannot sin, will be then united with a perfect body and with our soul, and then we will be complete the way that God has intended for us to be. So until that time, you know, we are, we are burying and planting that seed in the ground. That is the, the symbolic reference in, in, in hopes, in, the, in um, showing that we believe that there's going to be a resurrection. That's why we bury the body to, to be the same symbol as you burying a seed and then the new life springing up later. That is why, and we don't want to be screwing up this picture, right? 
The same way that you shouldn't be getting divorced, it's going to screw up this other picture of Christ and the church. You don't want to, you know, and, and for lots of other reasons as well. But the symbolic references, we don't want to do that. And now, like I said, you have no control over this after you're dead and gone. Right? You have, you have no say over the matter. And ultimately, it's not going to affect, well, someone cremated your body, so now I guess you don't get a new body. <laughs> it's, that's not the way it works. God will still be able to, to, to reconfigure. And, and it's amazing to me. I don't know how it's, how it's all going to happen because you think of like, you know, the, it says here that, that we're, we're going to be changed. And even those that are alive, those that are alive and remain, it says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse um, 51, Behold, I show you mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, just, just in an instant, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And, excuse me, we shall be changed. So it's like our body is literally changed and transfigured. It's changed into a different body. Um, I don't know how that works on a molecular level or an atomic level because you think of people who've been dead and gone for a long time and what actually literally happens to their body as it, as it goes into the earth or if it's been cremated and stuff. Obviously, even a cremated body has ashes. It has residue. It has substance left over. Nothing just goes into nothingness. It's all transferred into, into something else. So um, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little bit nerdy on you now, but I think about these things from time to time. I don't know exactly how it's worked, but I know that it will work because the Bible says that it's true. And um, the point is just, you know, maybe you've never thought about this before. You know, people will say, well, we need to conserve space on the earth and, you know, we need to um, make sure that, that, you know, these, these graveyards are getting full and I don't need, you know, my body, once I'm gone, doesn't matter anymore, so I'm just going to get cremated. No, you know, we shouldn't. And if you have relatives or friends that, are, that think that they want to be cremated, it would probably be a good idea just to, just to show them, especially this 1 Corinthians 15 is a great verse. If they're Christians, you know, maybe they'll listen to this and see like, oh, okay, I see why we do that. And, um, you know, I, I fully believe that there is at, at just a whole other level of, of understanding that people might not even realize they're gaining, that you can use to preach the gospel to somebody. It's a whole other aspect of it, of the resurrection. Because the resurrection is the hope that we have. It's the hope of eternal life. Not only eternal life, but just hoping and knowing that we will be resurrected. When Jesus Christ came back from the dead, that was our proof. He was the first fruits. He was that first fruits of that resurrection that we will all be, uh, be partakers of, that we will all have. He came back first, conquering death and hell and showing himself in his new body. And we will be raised incorruptible in the image of Christ as well. It's a big deal. I mean, they made a big deal out of it. There's an entire chapter in Genesis dedicated to, to Abraham, you know, um, getting this land and making sure that he has it. There's a big deal that Israel makes about it. And there's almost an entire chapter in 1 Corinthians that, that talk about us being sown in corruption but raised in incorruption. So let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words. We thank you for the Bible, dear God. Um, pray that you would please just bless everyone that's here tonight and help us to be able to walk closer to your words. Help us to learn more about the Bible, especially things that sometimes we don't think even matter at all. Um, let's always go to the Bible for, for our wisdom and for what we ought to do in all aspects of our life, dear Lord. We want to be pleasing unto you. Please continue to teach us these great truths from your words. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.